Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Today, Ukrainians were racing to rescue some of the hundreds of civilians who were hiding inside of a theater that was bombed by Russian forces in the city of Maripol. Russia bombed the theater yesterday, even though Ukrainians had written the word children in large Russian letters outside of the theater on both sides, as you can see here in this satellite image before the bombing. I also want to show you a video from the city of Cherniv, which I want to warn you is incredibly disturbing. Ukrainian authorities said the video shows victims of a Russian attack that reportedly killed 10 people who were standing in line for bread. Meanwhile, U.S. officials confirmed that an American citizen is among the people killed in Ukraine, but they haven't yet released any further details. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke about Russia's intensifying attacks on civilians earlier today. With every day that passes, the number of civilians, including children, killed and wounded, continues to climb. Russia continues to attack civilian sites, including this week alone, a hospital, three schools, a boarding school for visually impaired kids uh, in the Luhansk region of Ukraine. Yesterday, President Biden said that, in his opinion, war crimes have been committed in Ukraine. Personally, I agree. Intentionally targeting civilians is a war crime. After all the destruction of the past three weeks, I find it difficult to conclude that the Russians are doing otherwise. Blinken says it's difficult not to conclude that Russia is intentionally targeting civilians, which is a war crime. Now we know the people in Russia are being fed a steady diet of propaganda by the Kremlin and state TV, and they're probably not seeing the images of bombed apartment buildings, hospitals, and schools. And they probably aren't able to hear the words of America's Secretary of State. But sometimes cultural figures like entertainers and athletes can break through to people in a way that political figures sometimes can't. Cultural figures like Arnold Schwarzenegger, who has a huge following inside of Russia, and who today tried to puncture the propaganda bubble with a video directed to the Russian people and soldiers. To the Russian soldiers listening to this broadcast, you already know much of the truth that I've been speaking. You've seen it with your own eyes. This is an illegal war. Your lives, your limbs, your futures are being sacrificed for a senseless war condemned by the entire world. Remember that 11 million Russians have family connections to Ukraine. So every bullet you shoot, you shoot a brother or a sister. Every bomb or every shell that falls is falling not on an enemy, but on a school or a hospital or a home. Joining us now is NBC News correspondent Cal Perry, who is in Lviv, Ukraine. And Cal, lay out for us what you're hearing about the growing assaults on civilians all across the country. And it, and it really is, as you're laying out, Zerlina, it's the targeting of the humanitarian infrastructure that people need to survive. That's what we've seen really shift in the last 24 hours. If you start in Mariupol, where our viewers are now sort of familiar with this city that is starting to sort of be shelled into oblivion, you have the Russians having taken over a hospital there. So you have roughly 400 Russian troops in a hospital, and, and that in an urban combat environment does a number of things. It basically makes the patients human shields. Nobody's going to attack that hospital if there are patients there. You're denying medical care to anyone who's fighting the war on the Ukrainian front lines. Um, it is a way to terrorize the civilian population. In Cherniv, which you mentioned, that bread line, at least 10 people killed yesterday as they were waiting for food. Today in Kharkiv, you had the targeting um, of a marketplace, again, where people are trying to get food. So you have the Russians going after this infrastructure that people are relying on to survive. And then on top of that, you have at the very least, as you heard from Secretary Blinken, and he's been talking about this now for a week, you have the indiscriminate shelling of civilian areas. Um, yesterday, we talked quite a bit about the targeting of civilians as they tried to leave these areas. It seems now as though the Russians are stepping up these attacks onto, again, places where people are getting food, where they're trying to receive medical care. It is, again, a way of terrorizing the civilian populations, Erlina.
where you are, Lviv, it's a hub for people, as you said, from across Ukraine who are trying to escape Russia's attacks elsewhere. I mean, what additionally are you hearing from those people who are fleeing other attacks only to arrive um, and, and may not have safe passage to get there? So this is a city that is starting to burst at the seams, a city that is normally a population of some 700,000, now um, well over a million. A lot of the internally displaced people were absorbed into places like dormitories and public areas, but those are now full. Um, and so people are staying with friends, they're staying with family. But the train station here, for example, now has people sleeping outside um, at night because the city is just out of room. In Poland, you start to have those cities becoming overwhelmed. The, the mayor of Krakow saying by 15 percent, the population of the city has risen in just a month. Add to that, you now have air raid sirens sounding here pretty regularly. Four days ago, we had an airstrike about 60 miles from here. So you had a city that woke up to the sound of explosions. And if you are a family that has fled from Kharkiv, if you fled from these places in the east, you've done so usually without your father, your brother, whoever the sort of male figure in that family is, because because they've gone to the front. So you have families that have been separated who don't really have anywhere to go. Some people trying to still make their way to Poland, but that border, of course, is becoming busier and busier. And as the violence reaches into these areas, these civilian population areas, especially in the capital, we could see that second wave of refugees. We've already crossed 2.5 million. It's possible that we could see another influx, which, again, humanitarian organizations are going to have a hard time keeping up with. In terms of the folks you're talking to, um, you know, obviously, a lot of folks were trying to originally get out of Ukraine. But have you been talking to people who are planning to stay and try to seek shelter and refuge inside of the country, given passage out of the country is really difficult? Absolutely. There, there are people who are choosing to stay uh, in Lviv because they've found a place to stay or they don't want to leave until they absolutely have to. And, and, and that's true of anybody. Nobody wants to leave their lives behind until the, the very last minute. The other interesting thing that's happening, and I'm not sure if it's still true today, it was true a couple of days ago. There was a line getting back into Ukraine on the Polish border. People were waiting to come back into the country for a variety of reasons. You had family members coming here to try to rescue other family members. And then you had people who were trying to get into Ukraine to fight the Russian army. So we're actually seeing a weight on either side of that border. There's this human traffic um, that is now crossing both ways, which is, is something I didn't expect to see people rushing back into the country. But people are. There are people who are rushing back into this country because of the war. And in terms of the view on the peace talks, I mean, Russia and Ukraine, those peace talks are ongoing. Blinken said today he doesn't see any meaningful effort by Russia to end this war. And we're talking today about the targeting of civilians. What's the view among those folks you're talking to on the ground? So when you talk to people here, Zelina, they'll tell you that this is the hardest line that President Zelensky has to walk. And he's emerged as this national hero. He's emerged as now um, a global leader. But he has this impossible task of trying to direct his negotiating team to really do a number of things. One, to try to get humanitarian aid into these cities that are under siege, to just try and have a ceasefire in some of these areas so that the pressure can be lifted off of the civilians who are there. Two, how do you stop this war when Russian troops are on Ukrainian soil? It's, it's, it's so difficult for him to walk this line because at the same time, you want to stop the violence. Um, on top of all of that, there is no trust, right? There's, there's very little trust between the two negotiating teams. And there has been a concern here on the ground for the last three weeks that every time the Russians engage in a meaningful way, they're buying themselves time militarily, that they're buying themselves time, time on the battlefield. We saw this in Syria. We saw this in Grozny. So there's that concern as well, that just in engaging with them in good faith and trying for these ceasefires, that you're allowing the Russians to regroup. So it is a very difficult line for the president to walk. And, and keep in mind, he knows he's target number one on the Russian hit list, and he's trying to do this um, from Kiev, which is, of course, all the more courageous, Erlina. Cal Perry, thank you so much for your incredible reporting from the ground in Lviv. Please stay safe. President Zelensky has called Russia's tactics a war of annihilation. Not only has Russia hit apartment buildings, hospitals, and theaters, they're also targeting a key place where Ukrainians get their food. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has this report from Kyiv. 
Russia has now clearly resorted to siege warfare. It has surrounded the city of Mariupol. And here in Kyiv, it seems that Russia wants to starve people out. This was one of the country's biggest food storage facilities, and it's completely destroyed. There were 50,000 tons of food here. And the way it worked is food would come from all over the country, be stored here, trucks would pick it up, and then distribute it to the areas all around Kyiv. And it wasn't just bombed once. This was no accident. You could say, well, maybe the Russians hit it by accident. It's a large place. It was hit twice. And then another food storage facility just about a mile from here was also attacked. So three strikes seems like it could not have been a coincidence. And that Russia is attacking civilians, it's surrounding cities, and it's trying to starve people. Thank you to Richard Engel for that excellent report. Joining us now is Rachel Denber. She's the deputy director of the Europe and Central Asia Division of Human Rights Watch. And Rachel, that was incredibly difficult to watch. Do you think Putin is intentionally targeting civilians? And if so, why? Thank you very much for having me on the program. Well, Human Rights Watch has been documenting uh, the indiscriminate bombing and shelling of civilian areas in the war in Ukraine uh, since the war began, basically. And we've been doing, we have documentation in uh, cities of Kharkiv, in Bukhidar, Chernihiv, Mariupol, Irpin, Mykolaiv, is, um, and other places. And what we found is a, a, a distinct pattern of indiscriminate uh, bombing and shelling of, uh, you know, of civilian areas, um, regardless of whether there were you know, military targets there. And uh, particularly, for example, in Kharkiv, you know, we're finding that the military forces just show really uh, disregard uh, for civilians uh, through, uh, ind through indiscriminate uh, bombing and shelling. So, um, uh, look, the military might think they can disregard the laws of war uh, in, in the camp, in, in the war in, in Ukraine, but eventually uh, there, there's going, there needs to be justice. In a lot of ways, I feel like um, what we're seeing is both uh, the emptying out of Ukraine, right, forcing people to flee, um, to seek refuge, and you've had millions of refugees um, seeking shelter in other, other countries outside of the borders of Ukraine. But I also feel like, you know, when you're targeting a theater where they have written children in Russian on purpose, um, and it's visible on both sides, that feels like an escalation, for lack of a better term, or he upped mm -hmm. the ante in a way that he hadn't previously. We were talking with sure. Cal, to Cal about the last 24 hours. You're, you've been following this from the beginning, as you said. Do you see an uptick in the brutality in the last 24 hours in the same way Cal reported there? I think that we have seen an uptick in the barbarity of some of these attacks, not just in the past 24 hours, but really uh, in, in the past week or, or, or two weeks. I think early in the, in the war, we saw that they were mostly trying to get um, you know, military targets, airfields, and the like. But definitely in the past 10 days, we have seen an uptick in the indiscriminate attacks that hit, uh, that hit apartment buildings, that hit hospitals, uh, that hit schools, lots and lots of schools. We have definitely seen that in, in intensify. We've been documenting instances when people have been killed uh, when they're in line at supermarkets, uh, when they are um, in, in line at a water station, in one instance that we documented, we've seen a bomb in Chernihiv that, uh, you know, several bombs in a, in a totally civilian area that killed um, in as many as 47 people uh, in just in broad daylight. So, um, you know, whether or not these attacks are deliberate, you know, it's that's something that needs to be studied pretty, pretty carefully. Um, but to a certain extent, uh, even if they are not deliberate, even if they, uh, if there was some military object or military target in the vicinity, at a certain point, it really doesn't matter when when these attacks are taking out civilian uh, civilians, civilian infrastructure, and taking civilian lives on the scale that they're taking today. Uh, that can rise to the level of a war crime. Can you define a war crime for us, for those folks at home that may not actually know 
what the definition is, because this is actually important. Um, it's not simply, um, you know, a, a crime. Uh, it, it has a definition. Help us understand what it is. Right. So, there, um, so there's the Geneva Conventions that set out the rules of armed, the, the laws of armed conflict, and there are violations of international violations of the Geneva Convention, and not all violations reach the level of a war crime. Uh, for something to reach the level of a war crime, uh, either there either has to sh you either have to show uh, something uh, deliberate, or you have to show that the uh, violations are taking place with um, uh, with just total uh, recklessness. That there's reckless disregard uh, for civilian life. Like any any warring party, any any side to an armed conflict has an obligation just to, to distinguish between uh, civilian uh, you know, civilians and and and, and combatants. Um, and when you don't show that, uh, when you don't make that protection protection of civilians foremost, when you don't show that distinction, and you do that uh, repeatedly, it really doesn't matter whether it's deliberate. Uh, it, it can rise to the level of a war crime. And this is what is this, this kind of reckless um, uh, disregard for civilians and civilian lives. This is what's making, this is what's turning life, this is what's turning uh, uh, or big cities into, you know, urban landscapes of devastation. This is what's turning, uh, this is, which is what making, is causing such dire circumstances for civilians who, my colleagues who are on the ground in, in Zaporozhye interviewing people from Mariupol, who just, who just escaped, told us that they were making every effort. They were trying so hard to get out of Mariupol, and they had this, uh, you know, they had this uh, impossible choice of either staying in their basements and dying there or, or dying on the road because of the lack of, a, you know, the lack of conditions for them to flee in safety. That shouldn't happen. And now there are three, there are yeah. three mil, more than three million people who have had to, who have fled Ukraine for bordering EU countries. Three million people and almost, uh, almost 800 civilians uh, have been killed so far, 780 according to the UN, in just three weeks. It definitely should not happen. And with regards to those civilians that are um, pouring into other European countries, do you think, um, from your knowledge about about Putin um, and perhaps some of his calculations here, um, do you think it's a plus for him from his point of view that this refugee flow of refugees that keeps picking up um, over the course of this war? Do you think that will have a destabilizing effect on Europe as a whole? And is that a benefit to him? I think that that was the narrative uh, back a couple of months ago with the refugee crisis on the Belar on the on the Belarusian borders with on Belarus's borders with uh, with Poland and Lithuania. That I think that definitely was a calculated a calculation that uh, Lukashenko, the president of um, of Belarus and possibly also Putin, were, you know, were both making. I don't know that that um, that this necessarily enters the calculation now. Honestly, I can't get inside Putin's head, but honestly, I think that. Uh, that his goals in in crushing Ukraine, uh, uh, I think, are just separate from the any any imputed desire to unleash a refugee crisis in Europe. I think that I think that there are completely different uh, forces and priorities and like mm -hmm. uh, political imperatives that work for for Putin in this context. It's really helpful in understanding uh, some of this really complicated and real-time ongoing situation. Rachel Denver, thank you so much for being here today, and please stay safe. As we go to break, President Zelensky visited a hospital in Kyiv today where he learned he might have occupied at least one part of the world President Putin hasn't touched. We'll be right back after this. According to the UN, estimates more than three million estimates are that there are more than three million Ukrainians that have now left the country since the start of Russia's invasion. A global coalition of humanitarian groups had been working to assist those refugees, the bulk of whom are coming from Poland, are going to Poland. But there's also growing concern for the nearly two million Ukrainians that have been internally displaced. Their lives change forever as Russia targets hospitals, apartment buildings, schools, and even food storage sites. 
NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez is in Lviv, Ukraine, where he spoke to some refugees working to piece their lives together. The weight of the war is etched in these faces. Luba Peshekadova escaped with her grandchildren from eastern Ukraine. It's very difficult. Please help us, she begs. This is a makeshift shelter above the Lviv train station where medical teams are helping refugees battle deep trauma. Victor Vus is a psychologist who's volunteering here, but he's also a refugee himself who fled his home in Kyiv. All of us are in the permanent strength. This room holds children up to five years old. They and their parents might spend anywhere from several hours to several days here. Standing here, what really strikes you, is it because of the echo in this room? When one child cries, you really hear. From babies to teenagers, war is cruel. At a nearby hospital, 15-year-old Lara is battling leukemia while her country fights for its survival. It's horrible, she says. Instead of fighting this disease, we had to leave loved ones behind. Sometimes the physical scars are not what hurts most. It's hard to see her suffer, Lara's grandmother says. Like so many here, they're asking the world to do more. Thank you, Gabe Gutierrez, for that report. And joining me now, Alexandra Matvichuk. She's a human rights lawyer and head of Ukraine's Center for Civil Liberties. So we know now that Russia is targeting food warehouses. But earlier today, the CEO of a Ukrainian pharmaceutical company said trucks delivering medicine with Red Cross symbols on them have also been shelled by Russia. I mean, what's being done to help the millions of people potentially trapped inside of Ukraine? First, we have to understand that Russia uh, used these tactics deliberately. They isolated the um, towns, cities, and villages uh, in order to stop local resistance. That's why they don't provide uh, the humanitarian assistance to reach Mariupol, uh, Chernigiv, uh, other, other cities and settlements. Uh, in order to have a cooling effect to this um, action, we need international presence on the ground because UN, OECE, Council of Europe, they are monitoring this violation on distance. But we need them to be present during this evacuation and to, to see it on their own eyes. It's an important uh, perspective. You tweeted this picture earlier, and I want to show folks at home uh, the picture uh, shows what civilian cars that have escaped Mariupol look like right now, just completely decimated there. Can you give us an update about what things look like on the ground in cities like Mariupol that we've been talking about all week long uh, because of the atrocities uh, that have been reported from that city of nearly 400,000 people? It's look like a horrible movie, and it's hard to believe, but it's truth. People for a lot of days are without water, without food, without medicine, without connection. Uh, some people are hit the snow in order to have a water. We had uh, we re reported that uh, dead bodies are on the street and people have to bury their dead in common grave because it's impossible under the Russian shelling to bury that in another way. So. It's, it's a humanitarian crisis. And uh, today, only uh, 40,000, if I'm not mistaken, people can escape from the city. And other are remains. When you say that the international community needs to bear witness to what's happening on the ground um, and have a presence on the ground there, I mean, what types of things, lay it out for us in, in specifics, do you want the international community to do once they get there um, on the ground to ensure that people are, if they choose to stay or are, they're unable to leave, that they're safe and that they have housing and food? I am a lawyer and I believe in law. And this international system was created in order to protect, to prevent war. And if such kind of crisis happens, the international system has to react. And we understand that uh, the, uh, the staff of international organization don't want to risk their life 
and but if they couldn't fulfill the function for which they were created, they have now to find a flexible form of cooperation with local initiatives. Because on the ground, the volunteers' initiative who are ready to risk their life to provide humanitarian assistance, to help with evacuation, and to do monitoring of war crimes. In the short term, I think all of this is incredibly important to think about. In the long term, though, you even heard President Zelensky yesterday talk about the need for changes to our international institutions. Um, so to your point, what changes need to be made to those organizations uh, that are part of that international community that, as you said, are supposed to step up here when there is this targeting of civilian life in a conflict? I think that the change can be on two levels. The first level is architecture of international system. Russia is a permanent member of Security Council. It couldn't be uh, the aggressor state in, as a permanent member of Security Council, because Russia has a power of veto and can deny any reasonable solution of possible situation. And second, it's individual level. I strongly believe that people matter. And I know from history examples when people from UN, from Council of Europe, on a high rank position, ex express a, a courage, express a sincere solidarity, express a ordinary human heroism, and do very important thing, not from the safe places, but from the ground. And we need such example of human courage now. It's a, it's a really powerful point, thinking about, you know, there's a lot of us, I mean, I'm safely in my home. There's a lot of folks that are safely in the confines of their home doing analysis about um, this crisis that people are actually living through on the ground there in Ukraine. Do you think that the flow of refugees will increase? And if so, do you think the international community should plan for that inevitability in terms of long-term settlement for those refugees? We made um, a week ago a, a public appeal from Euromaidan SOS to international community, international organizations. We uh, say um, our sincere gratitude that they are taking care about refugees. But in this regard, it's the easiest task what has to be done, uh, I must say. The more difficult and challengeable task is how to stop war crimes. Because if we will not stop war crimes and further Russian invasion, this flow of refugees will be increasing. We uh, now have more than 3 million people abroad, but millions and millions of Ukraine are remains in the dangerous places. They are in Mariupol, they are in Kharkiv, they are in Kiev, they are in other oblasts of uh, Ukraine. And we have no safe spot on, on our map now, unfortunately. Alexandra, thank you so much for being here and helping us understand all of this. I mean, I don't know that, you know, a lot of folks at home living their lives day in and day out have spent a lot of time thinking about um, the international uh, res community's responsibility in times of crisis like this. But thank you so much for helping us understand all of that. Thank you. Coming up. Thank you. Coming up, the humanitarian crisis stemming from this war is dire. We've been talking about it all week long, and Ukrainians are not sure where to go anymore and if they wanted to leave their homes at all. We'll be right back. Oh, sorry. Uh, I love my city. Um, it's very beautiful. <laughs> we um, want to live the whole life there. Imagine you're fleeing your home, hoping and praying you can get to safety as your country is invaded, only to be treated like a second-class citizen when you get close to any shelter. That is what has been happening to some black people as they have tried to, fl to flee Ukraine. There have been multiple reports of racism, especially towards African students, as these refugees try to leave the country. We have seen a person of color being kicked into line, where black people 
being pulled by their jackets and dragged as gunfire goes off. In the latest episode of the Into America podcast, host Tremaine Lee talks to friend of the show, Kimberly St. Julian Varnon, and she says racism like this isn't uncommon in a war. You see these, these images and these videos and you're like, in the middle of a war zone, there's still anti-black racism. Hmm. But unfortunately, that didn't surprise me. You know, because I had lived there and I understood, I think war and conflict often just exacerbates things like racism. Joining me now is Tremaine Lee. He's an MSNBC correspondent and host of the podcast Into America. So Tremaine, what stories have you heard regarding the treatment of black people as they flee Ukraine? I tell you, one thing is for certain, Zerlina, it's like white supremacy takes no days off. Racism doesn't take a day off if there is even a war going on. There's so many of the stories that you mentioned, uh, people being denied access to trains, being physically removed from trains, uh, having the police call on them as they try to flee, or even if they make it to the border, that they're turned away. And so uh, the experiences of so many, again, many of them have uh, found their way out uh, safely by now, weeks into the conflict. Uh, but those stories, um, just days after all of us kind of um, held our breath and clutched our stomachs at the site of this war, just for days later for this kinds of, uh, these kinds of stories to emerge. Um, it's a slap in the face to so many, again, that white supremacy and racism isn't even taking a day off during a war. I mean, we've been talking all show about the human rights violations and the targeting of civilians. And so I feel like one of the things that should be said is like, people are people. <laughs> People's lives are equally valuable. <laughs> that should not have to be said. And in this situation, I think we're reminded oftentimes some people don't feel that way. In this episode, I want to play a little bit. You spoke with an Irish citizen born in Nigeria who is currently in medical school in Ukraine. Here's some of what she told you about being stuck in Sumi and temporarily moving into a nearby dorm for those international students. Train station, buses, taxis weren't running, went to the train station, absolutely packed, no movement whatsoever. People were just running up and down with suitcases and no one was moving anywhere. There were nights that I was literally, I'd fall asleep in my jacket and my shoes because you don't want to be looking for a jacket when everyone's running down and going to the bunker with no electricity. So it was just, I always had my bag ready. I had um, a small backpack with my passport and just little essentials that I always just carry to the bunker with me. And um, there were times where you'd be running to the bunkers. There was so much of us running. There were people fainted. Jermaine, how is she doing today? Uh, thankfully, uh, Annie is, is safe with her family back in Ireland, uh, physically at least. But she said uh, emotionally she's still shaken by the experience. Um, she said that, it, you know, one of those moments where she's finally home, but then her mother knocks on the door and she's startled awake because she's so traumatized um, from her experience. So, again, fortunately, she made it safely physically, uh, but emotionally and mentally, she's still shaken by the experience. In terms of the representation of, of black people, people of the Af from the African diaspora, and students in what was formerly the USSR, what is, what is now Ukraine and, and other um, nations surrounding, I mean, what's the history of, of students um, going to Ukraine um, for medical school and other uh, educational opportunities? Is, is, it, is it something that has a, has a through line throughout the last few decades? Yeah, even, uh, you know, further back than that, I mean, you think about under Stalin in the 1920s and 30s, uh, recruiting folks like Richard Wright and Langston Hughes to come to Moscow and study and show that, uh, you know, communist, uh, the, the communist regime was open and welcome to black folks, unlike uh, their counterparts in, in, in America. And then under Nikita Khrushchev in the late 50s and early 60s, um, as Africa was decolonizing and folks were fighting for, um, you know, their freedoms and, and revolutions were kicking off across the continent, um, the USSR was inviting these African students to, to come to the USSR, to come to Russia and the Ukraine. In more recent years, um, you know, you, folks have been coming because you get a, a really good, cheap education, um, you know, so a lot of bang for your buck. And again, these are places that have experienced black folks in the past. Uh, but the, the re regime after regime have certainly tried to exploit um, some of the racism uh, that had been seen around the world in, you know, recruiting and drawing African students. Now, in more recent years, some of that has changed, uh, but there's certainly that long history there. It's so fascinating to think about that history and then think about what's happening right now with Russian propaganda, because 
even during the 2016 election, one of the observations I made was mm -hmm. like, I think Russia understands us even better than we understand ourselves when it comes to white supremacy and racism <laughs> in this country. I mean, talk about how Russia is exploiting racism here in the U.S. Um, and exploiting um, racism against African students who are trying to flee Ukraine, even in this moment of this now three-week-old war. Certainly, when you think about um, what a, a good adversary does, a good adversary exploits your weaknesses, right? And America's uh, greatest weakness, I'd say, is its baked-in anti-blackness and its racism. And so we're talking about the, the 2016 election, for example. All of those um, kind of wild Facebook memes and all that stoking after George Floyd, a lot of it was natural-born, right? But a lot of it was stoked by, by the Russians and Russian bots. And they continue to exploit um, that kind of racism that folks are experiencing all over the world, even in uh, the Ukraine. Um, some in the early days of, of um, you know, those videos emerging of those black students being turned away at the border in the train, uh, there was some concern that the Russians were, were spreading and planning this, these videos to, again, further inflame, uh, to cause chaos and anger. Um, they're masters at that. We've seen it time and again, and it hasn't stopped yet, Zerlina. It's a really, really important aspect to this developing story that we've been trying to cover every single angle. And I appreciate you, Tremaine, for finding an angle that nobody else had found. Only you. Tremaine Lee, thank you so much. Into America, available where you get your podcasts. Definitely, definitely check this episode out. Please stay safe. Coming up, we're going to be talking to... Coming up, we've seen the crazy long table that Putin sits at with his advisors, but... Did you also know that he reportedly is afraid to even taste his food without having someone else taste it? We'll talk about that when we're back. Russian forces are bombing Kyiv every single day now, targeting civilian apartment buildings. The attacks are getting closer to the city center. Sky News special correspondent Alex Crawford has more from Kyiv. The capital's skyline is very different now. Kyiv's 18th century St. Andrew's Church, but with a backdrop of battle which is getting closer. The city's been put under strict curfew to try to limit the lives lost, but there's no protecting against attacks like these. A second missile strikes less than a minute later. The Ukrainian demands for a no-fly zone grow more ardent with every strike. And despite hints of progress on peace talks, the president's chief of staff told us there were red lines they would not cross. Would you be prepared to give up Donbas? Look, I say an answer to your questions. We don't discuss our freedom, our independence, our territorial integrity, our sovereignty. All another issue, we can see things and discuss. And my president, my president's ready to sitting in any days, in any place. But you're not prepared to give up any territory? Yes. No territory. Yes. They're on the lookout for Russian saboteurs. We filmed the detention of these two suspects before the capital's curfew. The Ukrainians are worried that Russian agents have infiltrated the main city and are acting as guides for possible airstrikes, leaving tags or markers on potential targets, or just acting as informants on troop and military movements. These concerns have heightened over the past 24 hours as the Russian soldiers inch closer to Kyiv and the center of Ukrainian power. Amongst those at risk of being trapped in the capital are scores of surrogate babies. There are so many, the nursery is a constant hubbub of crying demands for attention. The babies are being cared for in a basement, which has been turned into an underground shelter by a very small team of babysitters. 
These women have left their families to look after these little ones after the baby's actual parents couldn't reach them because of all the fighting. You have to understand this is war, this babysitter says. Not everyone is able to come. The airports are all closed, so their parents just can't pick them up. We love all the babies, another says. As she explains, they become part of our hearts, our family. And when the parents do take them away, we cry, she tells us. But with heavy fighting around the capital, it's meant the women looking after the babies here are also all that stands between them and the bombings. There are so many acts of defiance being played out on these streets. One soldier and his flute and the national anthem. We won't be ruled by others, it goes. In so many ways, he speaks for his country. Alex Crawford, Sky News, Kiev. Thank you to Sky News' Alex Crawford for that excellent report from the ground. <sighs> Babies. It's hard. Um, as Russia increases its attacks on Ukraine, it seems as though the world is watching the country's president unravel. Putin is claiming that he's invading Ukraine to, quote, denazify it. And who can forget the meetings Putin has held where the focal point has actually been an extremely long table, as you can see there, only then to outdo himself a few days later holding another meeting at an even longer table. So strange. There are even reports that Putin fears being poisoned. So he's having people taste his food before he eats it. NBC has not independently confirmed this point. Even his speeches are becoming longer and even more unhinged as he creates more devastation all in around inside of Ukraine. Take a listen to what he had to say yesterday. No, любой народ, а тем более российский народ, всегда сможет от, отличить истинных патриотов от подонков и предателей и просто выплюнет их, как случайно залетевшую в рот мушку, выплюнет на панель. Убежден, такое естественное и необходимое самоочищение общества только укрепит нашу страну. Here to discuss is Jeffrey Edmonds. He's the former director for Russia on the National Security Council and Ukrainian-American and Democratic strategist. Aaron Parnas is back with us. Jeffrey, I'll start with you. I mean, you saw a little clip there of, of Putin's comments. He's seeming unhinged uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks, even more so than previously. What do you make of those comments yesterday? So I think it's a sign that he is becoming even more entrenched in the in the narratives that he's developed over years. But now you have the added um, driver that he's he's by himself largely. I mean, there aren't a lot of people that interact with him, and so he has these narratives in his mind about you know he lives in a in a in a, in a, in a political system where you know leaders don't face necessarily very very good ends. But also the narratives about you know the U.S. always seeking to overthrow the Russian regime and by himself with increasing pressure around him, you, I, I, I agree. I, I think he's kind of becoming unhinged from reality and kind of living in this weird narrative world that, that he's created for himself. And Jeffrey, just a quick follow-up. You know, Fiona Hill uh, of you know Democratic and Republican administrations, expert on Putin, wrote the biography on Putin. She's quoted as saying that she sort of has this picture in her head of him during the last few years of the pandemic in the attic of the Kremlin, like surrounded by dusty old maps. I mean, I don't know if that's actually true. She says it almost as a joke, but she's like, he sounds like he had actually has been someone doing that. I mean, is that what you hear him steeped in this history that is maybe like on Game of Thrones style maps that are, you know, shredded around the edges and brown. Right. So so when you go back a number of years before COVID and other things, you know, the, the Russian leadership had certain complaints that while a lot of them were based on false assumptions, there was a certain logic to them, right? But like over the last year, you saw him write this really long article about Ukraine and going back thousands of years and about Russian history that's all really kind of jumbled together and doesn't make a lot of sense. And so I, I you know, I, I agree with Fiona. I think that, you know, very much he's been isolated. He's has this kind of sense of historic importance, whether, you know, obviously misplaced, where he thinks he's delivering Russia from some kind of state of humiliation after the end of the Cold War. Only what he's doing now is delivering them back into a state of humiliation once again. And Aaron, I mean, he definitely sounds like somebody who's, you know, operating with his own set of facts. 
Let's just say that. I mean, how do you think we got here to the point where he's calling people scum? Well, I think it's a lot about it has to do with his desperation. I think Putin is a very desperate leader right now. I think what we've seen over the past three weeks is that Putin's military offensive has failed. He initially wanted to take Ukraine within three hours or three days. He failed. Um, and he's becoming in increasingly desperate. That's why he's launching now attacks on civilians. Um, that's why there are rumors that he may launch chemical weapons attacks. Um, and that's really how we got here. It's because he's a desperate leader who isn't getting his way and he's just lashing out. And Jeffrey, President Biden, um, you know, yesterday referred to Putin as a war criminal. And this is what he said about Putin earlier today. Standing together against a murderous dictator, a pure thug who is waging an immoral war against the people of Ukraine. Jeffrey, do you think President Biden is egging him on a bit here by calling him a thug? I mean, is this why Putin brings up military actions of the West? I mean, how do, how do you think he interprets comments like this? Well, one, I think the president is right. And, and two, you know, Aaron's great points. I mean, I think he is very, very desperate. And I, I would not put almost anything by him. I think he would use chemical weapons in Ukraine. I think if it becomes even more dire, not to be overly, you know, gloomy about this, but if, if he feels like he's losing control, I would not doubt, I would not put beyond him, him escalating this conflict into a Russia-NATO conflict, the point there being to, to call our bluff and, and try to get us to back off. So I don't, one, I don't think he backs down. Two, he's disconnected from reality. And yeah, I think he's willing to do just about anything to get, to get what he wants in this conflict. Jeffrey Edmonds and Aaron Parnas, we'll have you both back because um, I have 10 more questions. I always have a million questions, but um, I appreciate your analysis. Thank you so much again for being here tonight and please stay safe. Brittany Griner is one of the most recognizable women in basketball players in both America and in Russia. She played there for the last seven years. She's a three-time Russian National League champion and four-time EuroLeague champion. But despite that fame, according to one Russian state official, Griner, as we speak, is sharing a cell with two other female detainees on a bed that is much too small, I am sure, for her six foot nine frame. The seven time WNBA All Star has now been detained inside of Russia for roughly a month, and it looks like she won't be coming home anytime soon. Russian state media is reporting that Moscow has extended Griner's detention until May the 19th. And that's about a week after the WNBA season begins. Greiner is being accused of transporting drugs after being caught in an airport with hashish oil. She's facing up to 10 years in prison on charges that some, including my next guest, suspect are being trumped up due to the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And joining me now is Texas Democratic Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. So, Congresswoman, so far, state and military experts say they've been trying to limit public outcry for Griner to ensure that Russia doesn't use, utilize her as leverage or like a pawn, uh, if you will. Um, but with them detaining her now for what they're saying is another two months, has that already happened? Well, first of all, uh, thank you again for having me this evening. And it is certainly important for me to say that we are all praying for Brittany, for friends across the nation, fans, and I would hope those in Russia would be praying as well, because she's done nothing but provide joy to us with her outstanding athletic prowess, her leadership, a love of family, and the ability for her to give the shirt off her back. I want to respect the family who wants their privacy and wants uh, to uh, be assured that nothing that is being done will hinder the release of Britain. All that I can say at this time is that it is crucial for the State Department to become intimately involved in her case, aggressively involved in her case, uh, and to exert the sovereignty of the United States of America. We are a sovereign nation, uh, and even though we may be holding Russian prisoners, and Russia and the United States, the circumstances of this case warrants a very firm hand by the federal government. And that's what I would expect to see 
over the next days and weeks. We want Brittany home, we want her released, but we want to not do anything that would extirpate the circumstances that she's now in. Uh, I think that the idea of whether or not she's been used as a pawn, that is a responsibility of the federal government. And as I have stated, I met with the president, I presented him a letter on Brittany's case, uh, and felt uh, that this case was now at the highest levels of government. And certainly, we want to see that exertion of power on her behalf. I, I think um, not just her family, but I think we all do. Um, and it, it, as we said at the top, this is no um, random WNBA star. This is no random woman basketball player. It's one of the best women basketball players in the history of the sport. Um, very well-known basketball player. Not that that means that she's more important than someone else. But I want to make clear that this is not an unknown quantity. This is somebody who a lot of people, um, you know, she's a beloved figure for those folks. I want to uh, end the show um, on something positive that happened in the Congress, which I dare I say is not every day. <laughs> um, yesterday, the Violence Against Women Act was reauthorized after for being in limbo for years, which Maybe that's my first question. How could that even happen? Um, but and you've championed that bill for nearly a decade. I mean, help us understand um, you know the components of the reauthorization that you think are most important to protecting people from intimate partner violence. Belinda, thank you so very much for that good news uh, cry, if you will. I cried for a decade, but I didn't cry as much as the advocates who had been pushing or the women who experienced domestic violence. Uh, we are proud and congratulate Joe Biden for his work in 1994, first introducing legislation that would fight against domestic violence, the scourge of domestic violence. But in the midst of trying to bring this bill back and to write really the most transformative bill, which we did, a massive bill, billion dollars, to fight against sexual assault, domestic violence, uh, making sure that the most uh, violent uh, stop or violent call that a police get is not domestic violence, uh, we were rebuffed over and over again. But we wrote a bill that enhanced the powers of Indian women who had been so abused and there were no accountability. The courts couldn't try individuals who ran across into a temple or reservation and assaulted, raped, abused a woman, and then could not be accountable. We've changed that. You will be held accountable. We then couldn't do anything previously about being in a mortgage or a lease or a rental property with the abuser, and you with your children had to be thrown out in the street. Now, there will be an actual officer in the U.S. Housing and Urban Development where they will be responsible for ensuring that the abused person doesn't have to be thrown in the street, the children don't have to be thrown in the street. We've done something about culturally sensitive organizations, provided resources for them, dealing with women from different cultural backgrounds. We've enhanced the training for medical personnel dealing with sexual assault. Uh, and the scourge of domestic violence uh, is on the rise, but it's going to be on the downward trend with this legislation because we're going to be training police officers, mental health uh, specialists, and others to be able to help these women, but also to help men and boys on how you deal with women and your anger. And so it has a myriad of new ideas, but most importantly, it has really expanded the power to help indigent and indigenous women, Native American women, and it has done something that has been the scourge of domestic violence, those women being thrown into the streets in the dark of night. I remember it in staying on the line with a victim in the Houston Area Women's Center, of which I was a board member some years ago. So I'm inspired that it is now law. I want to thank our friends and colleagues in the Senate, a small team uh, that worked very hard to get this done. Uh, and all my colleagues in the House. It was H.R. 1620 that went over to the Senate. It done that many, many times, but it came back uh, with provisions that were excellent, and the president commemorated it now some many years after 1994, uh, when it first was introduced. I was there for its reauthorization in 1996, mm -hmm. so it's an emotional time for me, but really, it's transformative to save lives. Please utilize the Violence Against Women Act please help save lives and save the lives of children as well. These resources and this investment is so critically important. It cannot be understated.
or overstated rather, is the way to say it. Um, those resources are, are needed in this pandemic because stats show that intimate partner violence has gone up um, during the last couple of years of the pandemic. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, thank you so much for being here today and for talking about both of these important issues. Please stay safe. That does it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. The Mehdi Hassan Show is coming up after a short break right here on The Choice from MSNBC. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.